tonight. The uh, board of the Friends of Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge is proud to debut four videos that were produced during the 2019 nesting season and highlight the work of Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge and the Friends of Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge. We also are unveiling our newly built website and um, that incorporates these videos. And after the presentation, please be sure to check out our new website and keep looking at it over the course of the year because we will be adding more information and features um, as we have time to do that. So all of this, the video production and the website was done with tremendous support from our donors who like us want to keep these 70 plus islands wild so that the nesting seabirds always have a place to raise their young here in the Gulf of Maine. And we certainly hope that after tonight, if you aren't a donor, you will want to support this refuge. So we can't visit these islands in person. They are reserved for the wildlife, but with the help of our award-winning filmmakers, we can bring the awe and wonder of these islands to you. So with that, I want to introduce Ben Severance, owner and tim of Timber and Frame Media, and Mauricio Handler, owner and cine cinematographer of Aqua Terra Films. And so, Ben, first, maybe you can just talk a little bit about how you got into this film business, and then Mauricio can, and then we'll debut our first video. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, Carney, can you hear me? Yes. You good? Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm Ben. I'm the owner of Timber and Frame. We're a video production company based out of Portland, Maine, and uh, we do a wide range of projects from nonprofit projects like this one that we're super passionate about, down like up to like big commercials for you know corporate America. So um, how I got started was actually in the swamps of New Hampshire and you know knee deep and sometimes neck deep with a Pentax K1000 taking pictures of ducks and whatever would get close to me. And I still have, you know, boxes and boxes full of blurry duck photos, I think in my parents' basement. Um, that's how I got started. And I moved into photojournalism and then into video production and when newspapers weren't doing that well. So I moved into video production and loved it. And we've been at this for eight years. So it's been eight years of, of making projects around the globe for a lot of really deserving causes. I mean, I could talk forever about it, but That's if you'd right. like Mauricio? to go on. <laughs> go ahead, Mauricio. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks, everybody, for uh, hosting this event and bringing us all together. Um, it's, it's spectacular to, to have this opportunity to share a little bit about what we did here right off the coast of Maine. Um, I started as a photographer uh, and worked in all sorts of events and things throughout my life, but I ended up with National Geographic working as part of the uh, underwater team there for not straightforward 20 years, but I did many, many assignments with them. And that's where I got my, my uh, kind of my hands dirty. I, I brought to what I do now, the complexity of filming in the field and creating this really elaborate projects. And that's what I love to do. In 2010, um, we started Aquaterra Films and based ourselves here in Maine. Um, I, I take that back, it was 2015, sorry. Um, that we launched our, our company here. Uh, I'm losing all track of time, it is 2010. So we, we moved over to Maine and, and really set, set up shop and started filming full time, uh, which is something I've been wanting to do. I had filmed before, but uh, never at the level that we're doing uh, since about 10, 12 years now. Uh, we film mostly internationally and because of COVID, we remained in Maine since March, which is really good for us because it's allowed us to focus back on what we really, really love uh, close to home. Um, so that's kind of a roundup. Uh, we film um, mostly underwater is my specialty, but I spend a lot of time on the surface uh, filming birds, marine birds and marine mammals and that kind of uh, creatures and creating content for uh, worthy projects as well as for documentaries from all over the, the, the world and for various clients. Um, it's a real pleasure, though, to be able to stay in Maine and stay focused, which is something that we had not been able to do because we traveled extensively. So thank you, Ben, for bringing me on board this project. And uh, I don't want to forget to uh, thank the directors of uh, FOMC for, for allowing us to tell the story. And of course, uh, the directors from uh, Fish and Wildlife, Eddie and Brian, 
um, both of them, which were a uh, tremendous help in, in pulling the logistics together for what we did. And it's a real honor and pleasure to be able to spend time out there. So thank you. Great. Great. Okay, so um, all these videos are about five minutes long. And so our first video is going to highlight the mission of the Friends of Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge. So um, Ben, do you want to um, share a story or make some comments and? Me first? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to reiterate really quickly that uh, it was just, it was like a dream come true and an honor to be able to go out to these places. And um, I just couldn't believe when I was like able to hold like a baby bird in my hand and we'd like interacted with a lot of different species that were there, but it was just like out of this world mind blowing to me to be that close to these like rare birds. Um, and just to know that that's such a privilege was like, I mean, that'll stay with me for my life. I mean, it was, it was wild. Mauricio travels to amazing places and I know has incredible experiences, you know, swimming with Komodo dragons and, you know, right whales and has these great interactions all the time. But for me, it was, it was pretty special. You know, this, this one instance was, was pretty great for me. And I'm, and I'm excited to tell more stories tonight. Go ahead, Mauricio. Uh, well, I, I can say that, uh, thanks Ben for your, your noticing the things we do, but I'll tell you what, the hardest thing, some of the hardest work I've ever done is filming on land and filming birds. They are, uh, you have to have a real, real patience to, to allow them to tell the story that you want. And in high def on a big screen, of course, the film and the images that you just saw will look spectacular and, and smooth. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the, um, the access to the islands, I'm very grateful to have had that because without access and without the time in the field, none of this is possible. You can't accelerate nature. Um, so it's been a real pleasure to, to finally start telling stories off the coast of Maine and within Maine the same way that we tell stories when we travel halfway around the world and bringing it to life to not only to international audiences, but to our folks here uh, at the level that we normally present only outside of the state. So this is a real privilege. So thanks. Great. So um, I don't know, Sandy, you're just gonna, if there's anybody that has any questions, they're curious about anything about filming, um, please put it in the chat box or the comments. Um, I am certainly curious about, um, you know, filming on how, how it's different to film on a out on a wild island versus, you know, fil filming on mainland, you know, Maine in the, in the forest or something. What are, are there different challenges or Ben? I yeah. Know ben. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say there are a lot more challenges. Uh, we, you know, just getting out to the islands. I mean, we had the help of Brian and Eddie, uh, you know, the the refuge. They were super helpful in just coordinating all the logistics. They're masters at that, getting on and off these islands. So that was the first challenge, was just finding the right window of weather and time that, that worked for us. But once on the islands, we had a lot of challenges. I mean, we when we were flying aerials with the drone, I mean, the birds didn't take too kindly, you know, to a drone being too close. And we had to be very careful. We had to keep the drone far away. You know, we didn't want to disturb the birds. And, um, you know, but even as we're like putting it up into the air, like off the boat, you know, safely at a distance, um, there, there are considerations we had to make. So we had to launch the drone off the roof of the boat as it's rocking in the water and then land it back on, the, the boat as well. And we lost connection with the drone at one point, you know, it almost went straight into the ocean. And at that point, we're just flying blind and, and hoping we land. Um, our sound guy uh, with his microphone, you know, he has like a boom, a big pole and a microphone on the end. And he was just dive bombed, you know, by, uh, by, by mother birds who didn't want us to get too close. And that's just the realities of living on one of those islands, you know. And that's what the uh, 
the people who live there and, and are collecting scientific data deal with every day. But it was new for us and certainly for our sound guy who didn't realize like the cacophony of sound that would be all around, you know, when we're filming and how hard it was going to be to get interviews that were clean, you know, the clean sounding. Um, that was a real struggle and we had to talk about like, how are we going to deal with this? Because you can't really turn down the mama birds, you know? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's not a quiet place, that's for sure. It's, uh, <laughs> it's very loud all the time, day and night, and you have to uh, attune yourself to what's going on and learn to read those signals and understand what's happening. Um, for this project, uh, Ben and the team went and did uh, uh, the aerials, the drones, the landscapes, the interviews, the science, uh, the details. And my role was strictly was to sit in a hide for day in and day out, um, trying to capture the flights, the behavior, the, the coming back with the food and the things that really require you to be on your own. Uh, so I was there sunrise to sunset in a portable blind that I carry. And to me, one of the biggest problems was the wind. Um, so the wind in a portable blind is always noisy. It also flaps a lot. So you're getting hit and between weather and wind, you have to pick your battles and, and know when to bow out. But in the end, you, you start un understanding that these animals have, uh, these birds have personalities. They're, they're different stories. And you know that this couple is going to come back at a certain time. So you anticipate that and you sit there and you wait for four hours. And then you see that the chick is waiting and it's been waiting for three hours to get food. So you know it's going to happen. Um, so I waited three, four hours to get a 10 second clip just of the mom landing. Uh, giving food and then only for a piece of grass to get in the way and then you had to do it again. So this uh, natural history side of things takes a lot of time, a lot of patience. And I kid you now that filming on land with where gravity is always against you carrying heavy equipment, trying to be silent, trying to be uh, unseen and try, try to be very discreet and respectful of your subject matter is, is very hard but um, it is very rewarding. Um, to me, one of, to, to go to the question, for me, my gear is very power hungry. So, uh, you know, um, I took a, Ben lent me a portable generator that I had running literally 40 hours quietly in, in the corner of, of the, uh, the dock area and then shut it off before sunset just to make sure I could have power. So it's a combination of how to keep alive all the technical things that we have and need in a place that has very little power or not any excessive power while still staying uh, fed and, and hydrated and also editing and transcoding and transferring the, the files. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, difference than working on the mainland where everything is pretty much straightforward and you can plug in somewhere. Um, and those are the things that we love doing, though, uh, being on the edge. So can you clarify, you, you said you were, you were editing simultaneously to film? No, not, not editing, but transcoding a few clips. And you have okay. to back up your footage. So if you film X amount, you have to back that up twice to have safety that your files are not going to go uh, you know, oh. bad uh, before you reformat your cards that you're going to reuse again tomorrow. So it, this goes on into the night. So literally it's from before sunrise to midnight, every night you're doing this and trying to time it and keeping your batteries charged. I worked alone mm -hmm. primarily in the field. I did have the help of course of the scientists that were there, which initially uh, made my life very easy by pointing to me the nests that were active and that I had to mm -hmm. take, uh, keep an eye on. But uh, after the day, day and a half of their um, pointing me to the right place, it was pretty much, uh, all right, let's make a master plan here and see what works. On day four, you start really getting a feel of what animals are really um, the, the game players, the ones that are facing the right light, the ones that are coming back and really bringing food to their, to their chicks. So very exciting, though. It's um, something that after 15 years in Maine, I had not seen yet. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have uh, capture these. Mauricio, uh, we have a question. How yes. long are you filming in the field? How long have I been filming? I well, start- Well, we're building probably for this. For, for this, this project, part. okay. Yeah, because you don't want to know my number. It's a lot, a lot longer. Um, I think the first trip, we did it in two trips, one in early summer and one in late summer. And that was to capture two different moments. One, the mating, the arrival, the nesting with the eggs and some chicks being born. And I think that one was four days uh, over in Machias. 
And then the second was at the end of the season. And really, it was an interesting visit because I went there with Eddie's guidance. Uh, guidance. Uh, we went there just at the last week, pretty much, that all the chicks were left for the Puffins primarily. Um, and it was a very busy, busy five days, six days um, that we were there. So in total, uh, I guess 10 days, you, you can call it, of, of filming. And I don't know how many terabytes of footage came from that. And of course, uh, Ben was in, entitled to, or, or, or in, engulfed with the task to edit all that. Um, <laughs> it's really hard to, to, you have to really, afterwards, you have to dissect all that massive information and come up with the, the clips that really tell a story or make sense. Um, and it's, it's not that simple. It's very, very hard. It's time consuming. Everything we do is extremely time consuming at one or in the other. Um, sometimes in the field, we got the chance or the opportunity to review some of the clips uh, quickly on camera before you back them up. But most of the time, I never got to see the final shots until afterwards. So you see them quickly, you review them, you know that they're there, and then you move on to the next one and try to get some sleep. So how about let's watch the next video and this one's going to focus on the work of our research technicians. Seeing some of this film again, it does it re, uh, can you recollect a, a, a story or something adventure that happened as a result of your filming out there? I think uh, one of the wild one of the wildest things for us, which might just sound like really geeky, I don't know if it's gonna come off as an adventure, but when we were out there, it's gonna fail me. I, I wish one of you know the experts here could weigh in and tell me what type of bird it was, but there was like this very rare, very small bird and it nests on the ground there. And uh, we were wondering if we would see it. It's not one of the ones that you normally see, I guess, and or at least at that time of year. And, uh, the the scientists that were out there were like looking for it and looking for it and they found it and they were attaching this tiny little transmitter to its back using this like very delicate like um i don't know if it's a needle or if it's like a thread i i wish i knew more about this I, you know I, it fails me but it was like it was like the er in there you know it was like george clooney in the e i mean it was like deathly silent in the room they found one they brought it in and I, and I, again, you know, I, I don't want to misspeak, but they were saying this is like a very rare or like a very new process, that it's not something that had been done before or done that often. And it was actually like pretty pioneer, you know, pioneering thing. And it was just amazing to watch because, you know, the, the room was just deathly silent as this like very delicate work on this like very beautiful and like delicate bird was being done. And I was running the camera and I'm just like kind of holding my breath and just like filming very close and just trying to, to get the shot, which, you know, we only had sort of one chance to get. And, and that's sprinkled throughout some of these films. Um, but that, that's, that moment really stood out to me and my team. Yeah. yeah I think no, it's, I saw it, um, Eddie come across to say that was a leech's storm petrol um, mm -hmm. that you were, you saw. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to give my hats off, take my hats off to all the researchers there. They, they work long hours and really are dedicated to this conservation effort, which it's a, it's a calling. It's not for everybody. And having the opportunity to see them work and, and dedicate their, their summers and their lives and careers to doing this is, a, is not only a noble, but essential for uh, the survival of the species that are there and the conservation of these islands, which in turn really makes us look a lot better, you know, as humans, as people, as species that we are. We're not alone in this. Um, I want to correct my comment earlier because I said a uh, different island, but we we're on Petit Manan, the first uh, round of filming. Uh, so uh, my mind escaped me there. Um, hmm. One thing that, um, that I would say is that I see the, every scene that I film, I don't see it as you would see it because, and, and I'm not, it's just a technical thing. I see it in high speed. So everything that I am filming, the, everything that we're doing in the field, I'm filming at about 83 to 90 frames per second as opposed to regular speed because it happens so fast 
that I have to anticipate the film, the, the sequence, and then when you play it back, it's very beautiful, slow motion and romantic, and that's what we're trying to do. But that moment only happened for two or three seconds, and then you turn it into a longer moment by slowing down that particular event. So I'm my brain is working at full speed, but my eyes and my perception of what I want to do is all with the anticipation of that slow motion. Uh, the, the, the puffins flying in full flight all together that you could be waiting an hour, two, three to happen and then it happens in two seconds because you blinked. Um, and there are a lot of missed shots, of course, and it's very frustrating when you do, but there you go. Um, and I think like what um, uh, Ben, you said before that you have to now take all this footage and create the stories that we wanted we want to tell. So like in this last one, we wanted to get word out to um, potential interns that would like to come to the islands to kind of get, this is what a sense of what it's going to be like. So if you want to apply for this internship, <laughs> this is what it's going to be like. Yeah, the, the major, honestly, the majority of our work happens in the edit. And so we work really hard to be strategic. And, and we talked a lot with you, Carney. We talked a lot with the Refuge and the Friends Group, many different people on the board. And we went back and forth about edits and edits and edits, you know, just to make sure that we were dialing that in that message. I don't think any of us want to make, to do, to go to all this effort to have Mauricio go out and sit in the blind for all those hours and hours mm -hmm. and, and not have this work make an impact. And so we just tried to create material like final videos that were very targeted and and you know, it was just great to collaborate with everyone to try to make that happen. You know, you just, you listen to every sound bite. And I think we had, I mean, we probably had eight hours of interviews, maybe eight hours total. And then in terms of footage, we had much more, you know, many, many more hours. And so we have to review all of it. And then you compare each shot against all the other shots you've already seen to, to see which one you think is best or which quote you think is best. We, we always go in with a plan, even if it's we're filming a documentary. I mean, I think the beauty of documentary is that you have to deal with the serendipity of the real world, and that mm -hmm. makes beautiful things happen and unexpected things, like uh, that surgery. I mean, it wasn't a surgery, but that you know, amazing moment that felt like the ER with George, you know, George Clooney. Um, but uh, we always go in with a plan. And, you know, it's like... Some famous boxer said, I, I don't know, but it's like, everyone's got a plan until you get punched, but you got to have a plan. And so we try to always go into the plan knowing we're going to get punched a lot. And then we have to pivot. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, same thing here. I just go with a list of uh, the birds and in order, uh, not necessarily a priority, but maybe accessibility. Those are going to be easier to capture and then try to make my own image of, of the behavior I want to do and I want to film. And my punch uh, that Ben just mentioned was day first, I'm sitting there with, uh, I think it was Haley, I was telling her this, I really want to capture this. And then she says, that'll never happen. <laughs> so I had to reroute the whole thing because the, the chicks don't, um, don't leave their nest, don't flee uh, during the day normally, it's always at night. And I was hoping this wonderful moment when the bird, the, the little chick comes out and stretches its wings and then greets the world and flies right in front of the camera. Forget it, not happening. <laughs> So you, you try to restructure your brain a little bit and, and, and take the punches as they come along. Uh, in nature, there you can never repeat a shot. It'll never be repeated. It'll be different. You might have something similar, but different. But the one that you've got, that will never be repeated. And, it's, um, and if you live by that thought, you try to capture it and not fail that first time around. But if you do, you, you can't dwell on it. You go and you, you carry on your checklist uh, of moments. And the checklist changed every day. Every day there was a conversation. What's happening today? Where are they? Who's there? Who's not? And, and you try and expand that checklist, even though it's impossible to capture everything during such a short visit. But it's a great challenge to do so. Do you recall something that um, you captured that was not even on the checklist that was totally unexpected? Absolutely. And we can, uh, it can be a segue into the issues at bay. And this was not a pre-planned question, but I, I, it was two moments. One was a um a turn but it was a common turn chick begging for food to an arctic turn mother and she'd come down and try and give it food 
and the chick would refuse it. And then they were alternating species. I'd never seen that before. So there was something going on there that I didn't really capture uh, in, in my brain. I mean, I captured the sequences that the mother would, or, or this adult would come down with a fish and the little baby would come out and chase the mother out and say, I don't want that, I want the other. And then when I started looking, it was the, the butterfish that they were being delivered, which is a, a, di a, a dial shaped fish. Uh, which is these birds can't swallow them. They, they need to have a specific yeah. elongated fish that'll go down the, the throat, right? So all these, uh, you know, butterfish are hanging around and, and, the, and the birds can't eat them because they, they're not physically able to eat that kind of fish. And those butterfish, from what I understand, again, I won't get into the science, but they're, uh, the climate's changing, the water's warming. These are not normally found in the area. So these birds are going to go out hunting and get whatever they can in the end of the day, albeit the wrong diet uh, for their mm -hmm. chicks. Um, so it's a little cross species, a little frustration, a little battles, uh, but beautiful nevertheless to see the resilience of these chicks that were there. Uh, very interesting. Yeah. So before we um, look at the video about the seabird challenges, we're going to look at this next video focuses on the educational work that's being done by staff and volunteers at the Visitor Center in Rockland. So let me share that. It's uh, so good to see that because, of course, this year we haven't been able to be in our Visitor Center because of the uh, COVID virus. Um, but we know it will happen again. Yeah, when I was uh, seven or eight years old, I was, I grew up in Michigan for a few years there and went to elementary school and had a great teacher. Um, and he f took us out in the wild and I had to make drawings of all the birds and then make a book out of them on paper. That's how it was with crayon and Crayola and so forth. And it, it was that initial encounter with things I never filmed, never took a picture. I was just drawing and, and being made aware I'm sure influenced the passion that I have for being outdoors and filming and doing wildlife uh, cinematography. And I think that it's very important and crucial what you're doing uh, for the kids of Maine, because we assume because they live in Maine, they have access. And a lot of these kids don't, they don't understand the connection yet. And if you implant that early, it's there, it's not going anywhere. And hopefully they'll be the ones that will be the stewards, as you know, uh, later on. So I understand um, that there was um, some weather issues that were kind of challenging uh, getting out to the islands or filming on the islands. Yeah, Ben, you wanna, you had some weather issues? <laughs> um, I think we just had a lot of, we were just trying to be really strategic and we had a lot of delays and our producer, Matt Perez Mora was, who's a Mainer, himself so as you know he grew up in augusta as well aware of, of the main weather uh he he worked hand in hand with uh eddie edwards to to coordinate um i didn't have a whole lot to do with that logistics coordinating which was nice for me but i know also mauricio you had to really plan around the weather in the seasons too right yeah, no, we, we did, and I was in touch uh, extensively with the base in, in Rockland, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife with Eddie and the team there, and Eddie was uh, always kept me abreast of, of, of what was going on and when we could go, when we could not go. In fact, I was, I think, in Mexico, and I called him, or no, he, he made a call, and it just, I was in this room, for coincidence, in a hotel room, and I get the call from Maine, and we started chatting, saying, where go, or something like that, and I said, I'll be there next week. And, and we just planned it and then we had to wait and wait for good weather. Uh, when we left, uh, we went with the, the Fish and Wildlife team up to, um, I think uh, that was, would have been the second trip, Matinicus Island. So we had a major, major front come through and, and I'd never been out here. I've sailed a lot, but I've never been out here when you get those gusts of wind that really can make a difference in, in your day. Um, and we had to stop. We had to halt the boat. Uh, and this is an aluminum heavy boat with all our gear and all of us on board. And we had to just wait it out because they come through their cells that just come out. And this kind of weather is immediate. It's uh, instantaneous. It's strong. It's powerful. And it affects everything around it. But Maine is that because of these weather. And so the birds on the islands also have to put up with this. Uh, chicks that are abandoned, that are left uh, unattended from a nest can freeze to death, can get too cold, too wet, and they can't warm up again. So there's a lot of 
uh, risks involved with the weather that we have to deal with. And then of course, uh, make it over there to the island and, and be able to work. Uh, rain is the enemy for most of our work always, just because of the sensitivity of the equipment, even when we're protected. So uh, luckily we had a few bad days, the rest were good. And as long as it's uh, not raining or too, too, too windy, um, then we're good to go. I'm kind of curious about your um, drone technology um, and, and the use of drones. And I'm thinking about being out on the islands when it can be so windy. So when can you use the drones? When can't you? How have they changed the world of filming? Yeah, um, I can kick this off. And then I know Mauricio has uh, thoughts about drones as well. The, um, the drones that we're, I mean, the drone technology has, just rapidly advanced in the last few years. I mean, it's incredible the quality that you can get in such a small, what's like a smaller and smaller package. Uh, you know, we are using uh, a DJI, on this shoot we're using a DJI Mavic Pro, which is a very small drone, which fits well inside of a backpack, is easily packable, bring on the boat, land on the roof of the boat, which was not fun for me at all as the you know commercial drone operator. Uh, it was more than a little nerve wracking. And, uh, you know, in terms of like conditions, it certainly does not like the rain or the snow. We've, we've flown it in light snow and light rain, um, but wind really does knock it off. It has a GPS like uh, alignment system, so it can stay in one place even as a gust is blowing against the drone. So without me doing anything, it will self-stabilize and maintain a home point despite the wind, up to a certain degree. Uh, and that just depends on the size of your drone, of course. And ours is like very small. I mean, it's, it's you know, just maybe eight, eight nine inches long, you know, and, um, you know, three or four inches across. So it's, 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 it's very small. Um, yeah. Uh, Mauricio, yeah. I know that you have a lot of experience with a wide range of drones. Well, we're working, uh, we've worked with the Mavics and all that, but the, the Inspire 2 line of, of uh, drones with the newest cameras, the latest EX7 line, Micro Four Thirds, which are really uh, the, the, the standard for cinematography for the highest BBC programs that you might see on TV. They're all using this technology. And in and, and a couple of seminars that I attended and met with all the producers and that, we've reached a point where the drone technology is really good. And it probably can improve on a few things like more power to, or, or more battery time. Uh, but the optics are amazing. The optics and the stabilization and, and the power and the, everything has reached a point that it's really, really well fine tuned. Um, so the bigger you go in a way, it does handle the wind a lot more, but also it drains a lot more power. So there's always a trade off. You have a nicer camera, you can only stay up X amount of time. So you're gonna lose certain shots. And uh, so far you wanna be able to have a, cam a drone that you can work on your own or maybe with one other person as a camera operator. But the days of having a big team to operate a drone are, are there for bigger productions, but not necessary anymore. I think we're producing some really high standard um, sequences that are gonna be with us for the next 10, 15 years and not feel outdated because of the technology. Drones have changed everything. Without a drone in a shoot, you, you can't tell the landscape, the story, the, the setting shots that will bring in the context of what you're doing. Uh, it's very difficult. Before we had to hire a helicopter and imagine flying on one of these islands with a helicopter filming, the birds would go nuts. And, and, and that's the way it was done before. You had to keep your distance. You had to do it very quickly, maybe one or two passes, but you couldn't play the game like it's been done now. So this is a great time to be a filmmaker. Um, I, I must say that. I think you agree, Ben? Yeah. yeah. And I can't remember, did you say before um, that, would the turns try to attack the drone? Yeah. That, that happened. Um, and that was a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're flying the drone and you can see in the camera that like they're coming at you. And uh, yeah, I mean, they knocked the drone around a bit. Yeah. You know, like I have footage where the drone then like gets rocked. And we're like, okay, we're gonna back off. You know, we're gonna we're gonna step it, step back. But this is a this is a behavior they do every afternoon. Petit Manan, we would sit in the afternoon waiting for the eagles to come in to try and steal chicks, just at the low end of light. 
And so all the terns, as soon as they see, uh, whether it be a, a you know, seagull or, or, or a hawk or, or an eagle, they all take and fly at the same time to create a false wall. And they, try and, and they scare that bird off. So one bird couldn't make a difference, but a thousand birds would scare off a bird. So when the drone comes in, it's just another predator trying to come in. Wow. Uh, very basic behavior, but it would be very bad for the drone, I think more than the birds. <laughs> Arnie, before you go, move on, um, we yeah. did have a question about um, programming. So we have a question that says, do you have online programs for students this year? And yes, as a matter of fact, we do because our park ranger, um, Kate Owen has um, created a lot of learning opportunities for um, school children. Um, and she's now offering, um, people those opportunities and all you need to do is um, we're going to put her um, email address in the chat or you can also call the wildlife refuge at 594 area code 207 594 and um, ask for Kate and she will um, be really really happy <laughs> to do some presentations for um, children that are in line with the uh, science standards in Maine. So um, I think um, with that, I'm going to share our um, final video. Um, someone had asked earlier about how climate change is affecting the seabirds. And this last video talks about uh, seabird challenges. So um, I'm curious about um, you know, you brought your expertise of filming to bring these wonderful stories to us. And um, I'm wondering what um, kind of you took away from this whole film project for yourselves that were kind of maybe have been a surprise for you based on what you learned. I guess I, it's like what wasn't a surprise and what wasn't a learning <laughs> experience for me. I. You know, I knew that there were puffins out there somewhere. I knew that there were islands where they lived and that Maine was one of the last places that had them. I knew nothing else. You know, I knew there were puffin cruises, but I was like, I don't know if that's, you know, I'd never gone on one. Um, I just knew so little about a place that's actually pretty close, but still like very wild and, and really close to where I live. I live here in Portland. And so everything was eye-opening to me. I think one of the biggest takeaways I had, which was a huge surprise to me, was just that how some of these islands have been reclaimed by these species due to the direct, like, due in, like, com like completely due to the work that's being done by the refuge. And that without that support, these birds would not exist. That really blew me away. And that there were islands where you know, there had been no birds for a long period of time. And that it wasn't until the refuge came in and helped to like reset that ecosystem from like destruction that had happened previously, uh, that they now are thriving ecosystems. And that those birds came back incredibly quickly. Like that blew me away. And I was like, wow, this is an incredible story and it needs to be told and I don't know if everyone knows this. And, and I pride myself on doing a lot of work for organizations like Maine Coast Heritage Trust and Nature Conservancy and we've been all around the state filming for them, but I just had never known that. It was really wild to me. And, and also the last thing I'll add to that is that I had no idea the amount of like pioneering research that was going on in terms of like discovering the migratory routes all the way down to Antarctica and back and how that was you know, happening with the scientists here. Yeah. yeah, I can add to all that basically a little bit that I, I spent most of my time outside of the country. I live in Maine, but I work abroad and from Indonesia, Malaysia, Chile in particular over the last few years, I've been going there five, six years in a row. And the coast of Maine, honest to God, has no, has no shortage of world-class scenery, wildlife, and storytelling. This is BBC material. This is an amazing corner that is, has been told and is slowly starting to get that recognition. 
and what happens with recognition is comes conservation. So you need to do these films and you need to get the word out because otherwise folks don't know it and we can't conserve and protect and obviously fund, which is a huge part of this whole thing. We've seen in, Co in, in Chile where I was born, a lot of the national parks are paper parks. They are underfunded, they are not protected, they're not manned. Uh, in Indonesia, the same thing from sharks to birds to endangered species, unless they are manned and unless they're taken care of, they might as well not exist. And so in Maine, we cannot lower our guard. Um, and this is a prime example of how to do things right and have that balance between science, conservation, and uh, community outreach where we can show this is yours and we can see it from afar and we can maybe have some involvement, but we have to give these animals their space. And so I love being here in Maine and, and start discovering more stories like these because uh, we have an incredible coastline uh, and I am, don't want to fly again. I'm tired of flying, so I just want to drive. <laughs> so yeah, it's, a, it's an exquisite landscape, but honestly, this is uh, one of the few places in the world that you're going to have this concentration of uh, nesting birds. Uh, and that's, that's the way it is and we have it yeah. here. Yeah. So I just want to remind people, I'm going to just share one, um, a last um, screen here um, to let you know that um, you can share these films are now available on our website. And please share these videos far and wide with your friends um, because um, they do tell the story about these wild islands off the coast of Maine and what the important work that this Maine, the Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge is doing. Um, if you're interested in learning more about our upcoming programs and refuge work, um, we do have an e-news. You can sign up for that on our website as well, um, or just check under the events and see what's happening. Um, I would like to um, thank everyone for um, coming tonight. Sandy, were there any more questions that needed to be addressed? Um, yes, we had a couple of questions. Okay. We had, um, let's see, I got to scroll back up to find it. Hold on. It was a question wondering how much research do, um, do you do about seabird species before filming? Yeah. I feel like well, that's, that's one for yeah. you. I mean, you before you go in the field, obviously, you try to uh, educate yourself if you're not already aware of certain things, um, the same stories, because you're, you're always thinking natural history. But you do try to remember the biology and the, the rhythms that they have and when things should be happening. It's no use showing up in November to these islands, obviously, because not much is happening. Uh, we need to go during the nesting season and we need to know what the behaviors mean. Uh, so we can anticipate uh, sequences that are going to make a difference and not miss them. Um, a lot of this is intuitive. It's something that, um, you know, we're hunters. Filmmakers are hunters, but we hunt with the camera and we are very aware. We want to be not seen, but we want to see everything. Um, so you do study as much as you can that's available from online to talking to scientists and even as, every day in the morning or afternoon during dinner or, or early coffee, uh, I'd make, I'd, I am made aware of something different that is going on and some different behavior. So you're adding to that checklist of um, your knowledge base, but uh, there is always general things that you always know and then there's always species driven behavior that makes a difference. And then all of a sudden, like the cross species of the Arctic and common tern, which you don't anticipate, but now you have that checklist and you can talk about it. Um, it's important to stay educated and aware and always on top of things. I, I belong to all the uh, main forums on wildlife and birds because every day something comes in. You can't have your eyes everywhere and people are observing different things and the scientists on the islands are observing new things. So all that uh, eventually will make its way to the way that you film and try to tell a story one sequence at a time. And then of course, Ben uh, will need all that information to be able to put it together and tell a compelling uh, scene. So I really, um, I don't know, do you, Mauricio, Ben, do you have any final comments you'd like to make before we close tonight? I um, just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. I think it's a great opportunity to bring people from afar. So thank you, everybody, for taking the time on, on this evening. 
And thanks to FOMC and uh, Fish and Wildlife, and of course the managers and all the wonderful staff at the islands and, and researchers. Thank you for your support on this project. It's been great. Thank you. Yeah, I I couldn't uh, reiterate you know say amen any more to that. Uh, just thank you for the opportunity. It was a uh, it was wonderful. And I just wanna I wanna thank the donors that helped to make this filming pro uh, possible and um, we're so excited and to have these stories to share really with the rest of the world um, so and that's so exciting um, so I want to just thank everybody for coming in tonight take care of yourselves so that you have the energy and strength to take care of this planet so um, be well <laughs>